Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Christmas, Christmas reminds me of hope for deliverance and light for the darkness. And I thank God for that because every, every once in a while you need a, a, a reminder of that. Amen. And our world, our world needs both right now. We need hope. We need light. We need someone to show us the way through this. And maybe today, evil and darkness and despair has overcome you as a believer. Uh, I, don't, I don't count that out. That happens. And I just sense that God has this message for us today. And that God really does want us to give up a spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise. For a garment of praise. And it's interesting because if we, if we follow Jesus, his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But if we follow this world and we're consumed by what's going on in our world, guess what's going to be heavy? Our burden. The yoke of this world. We're giving up the yoke and the burden of this world. And every time it gets heavy, we need to praise God. Because praise makes us think about the goodness and the glory and the provision and the help and all that God has done. It turns our, our struggles into thanksgiving and praise. So I thank God for that. And I prayed all week for this. You know, Jesus came into, into the world at a time where it was dark. It, there was a lot of despair. There was no light. It was dim. Let's put it that way. For 400 years, it was quiet. There were no prophecies. There was no one to guide the Israelites. Malachi is the last prophet, the last one that spoke. And for 400 years, the Israelites were, they were actually ruled by other nations. First the Persians, then the Greeks, and then they, they rebelled and had a little revolt, and it's called the Hasmonean period. This is before the narratives of, of uh, the Gospels begin. This is all happening. It's not in your Bible. It's called the intertestamental. Uh, intertest I'm practicing like Jody had to. <laughs> Proprietary, right? <laughs> so it's in between. Let's go with this. In between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this was a period that you don't see in Scripture. You have to look at Christian history and uh, writings from the Jews and the Israelites to actually read this. Even the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians put these things in writings. And so historians have these. And they can tell you that the Israelites were actually, they were actually growing in number but still suffering. Why? Because they didn't have a ruler of their own. And they were oppressed. They were allowed to worship, but they weren't really allowed to thrive and be free, and they didn't have their own ruler. And even when they revolted and won against the Greeks, they had no unity. And by the time the Roman Empire came, they were so weak and there was so much disunity that they just came in and just sacked them. They were gone. Quarterback sack. And then we have the Christmas story. Then we have Judea, and Herod the Great is in charge in this time. And that's where we're going to pick up. So let's go to Luke chapter one. Hope was barren in this time. There, there was no hope. There was a light that was dimmed. Just think about that. Is this going to be your future forever? Is always ruled by another? What about the prophecies of a Messiah coming? Where is all of that? And I have to say, there was a glimmer of light from Malachi 4, and I'm going to read it for you. Malachi 4 2. This is what he said before everything went quiet. He said this But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to a pasture. That was Jesus. That's Jesus. Healing in his wings. You will be free. And then it was quiet for like 400 years. So when was that going to happen? Well, guess what? It began actually with Zechariah and Elizabeth first. And that's where we're going to be at. So let's go to Luke chapter 1. And uh, it's, it's, there's quite a bit. 
but what we're going to do is paraphrase some parts later on, and I'm going to read the first part with you. So Luke 1, I'm in the NLT version, verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. What does that mean? They were obedient on the outside, but they were also obedient and worshiping him on the inside. See, when God sees you, he doesn't just see what you're doing on the outside. He sees what you're thinking, your motive on the inside. They weren't going through the motions of their life. They actually really did love God. And so when God saw their righteousness, he chose to use them as well. I praise the Lord for that example for me, that it's not just about what I look like on the outside and what I'm doing at church and going through the motions. It's about, am I righteous on the inside? Am I righteous on the inside? That's a whole other sermon, isn't it? They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. This is what they'd do. They would, they would burn incense, uh, and they would pray, and the group of, of the people would be outside waiting for, for Zechariah the priest to come out and give them the, Aaron, the Aaronic blessing that we read in number 6, 24 through 26. May the God of peace be with you, that whole blessing. They're waiting outside for that. While Zechariah was in the, in, in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Well, hold on a second. I can kind of imagine right now that Zachariah is like, wait, wait, wait. I didn't pray that recently. <laughs> that was a while ago. That was a while ago. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. They will have great joy and gladness because they've had so much depression and despair this entire time. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. Drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Now, you just got done learning about the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. Filled with the Holy Spirit before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the Spirit and power of Elijah. Just so you know, in the Old Testament, a lot of times, um, especially in Malachi 4, Malachi predicted that Elijah would come on the scene again, and it was kind of confusing because Elijah was gone. He was dead. Well, Elijah was a foreshadowing of John the Baptist. And so Elijah and John the Baptist are sometimes confused by the Jews. But what, it, what he was saying here is, is that you're going to be like Elijah. And so God's going to use him as a, as a powerful prophet. So we're talking about John the Baptist here, not Jesus. It says, He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So things are going to start restoring in this community. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years so we have the impression here that this wasn't something he had prayed that day. We have the impression here that he had prayed this when they were younger. Now, in this culture, it was, it was thought to be a curse if you were barren and didn't have any children. Um, and so this it was a disgrace for, for Elizabeth. She walked around in shame. And uh, it shouldn't have been like that, but that's the way that culture was at that time. And it's sad that it was. And God was blessing Elizabeth with a child coming up. So cool. But here, let me, let me just do a side point here. We pray prayers, but I think we forget that we've prayed them. 
God doesn't forget. God has not forgotten your prayer. And nothing is impossible for God. I don't care how many years you've been praying for a miracle, whatever it is, God has not forgotten your prayer. It's one of the reasons why I write my prayers down. So I can go back and look at them and go, answered, 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 answered. We forget, but God does not forget. I praise the Lord for that. How can I be sure this will happen, he says? Well, the angel says this, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Wow, that's cool. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born, for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Can we blame Zechariah, though? <laughs> Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went to seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. This came as a surprise to Zechariah, and I think we, we can really think in logical ways or in human natural ways. But God, God doesn't work in our ways. He confounds earthly wisdom and logic. And it's interesting that Gabriel, an angel, was telling him this and he still struggled to believe. That tells you how much despair and doubt he had in him. You know what's amazing? I thought about this, that Jesus himself, God himself came and told us the truth, and people still doubt. Zechariah had an angel, so at least there was like a little telephone game going on. But Gab G Gabriel speaks for God, so it's the truth. It's the same thing. There's no mess up, and he didn't believe. And, and while we can say, do you blame him? At the same time, God is asking us to have extravagant, crazy faith like this, especially in a world of despair where it seems like all things are going wrong. And then to doubt the words of God himself in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, how dare us doubt the words of Jesus? But yet sometimes we do, or we forget that God is able and that anything is possible with him. There's no reason to doubt the words of Jesus Christ. It's God himself speaking to us. Praise the Lord. A refresher of what Jesus says will be a good idea come January. Amen? We're starting right now. Let's look at Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, because God wasn't done doing miracles, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. There it is the ruler and the Messiah they've been waiting for. Hope is rising now. Hope is building. It's bubbling up in this scripture, church. Things are getting exciting at this time. This is what's happening at the first Christmas or the, the first and the beginning of the first time Jesus, right, came into the world. We celebrate as Christmas, the day of Christ, I always remember that it is the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ is Christmas. Things are moving. Things are building here. And now Mary's experiencing 
experiencing a miracle and a promise of this. Now, at this point, the hope of deli- deliverance has dawned in this hopeless situation. A nation of people barren of hope would soon be filled with the hope of deliverance once more. Hope would rise with two women and two children, the miracle of John the Baptist through the older and barren Elizabeth, and the impossible, the birth of the Messiah through a young virgin, Mary. And now this once oppressed nation is pregnant with hope. It would soon see the light of the world lead them to their long-awaited deliverance. And it's interesting a prayer that was thought to fall on deaf ears has been heard. And unexpectedly answered. So, one of my favorite parts of the story is what comes next. Verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. And let me back up real quick because there is words here that I forgot. Uh, Verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. She asked, how is this going to happen? In verse 34 and 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. I love her response. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Wow. They said that John the Baptist would be filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. Guess when it happened? The only logical explanation, if you're trying to be logical, is right here. And what did it take? It took to be in the presence of Jesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What did we learn? Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. It could mean here, now, now, you know, now just know, there's much more research can be done. This was Jesus' first spirit baptism. As a baby. How powerful is Jesus? How powerful is his presence? That's weird, right? Like a baby doing that, but it's true. Like, what other explanation could there be? It was in this moment where the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth, and now John the Baptist is being filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. And he is the first Well, he's a baby worshiping Jesus. And what I love about this too is not only is now the story of of the birth of Christ and Christmas injecting hope, but now it's injecting joy. Joy. Unspeakable joy. Unexplainable joy. Because I can't explain how that happened except for God. God is just doing miracles here. There's joy in the presence of Jesus There is no joy outside of Jesus, I'm telling you. There's temporary happiness, but there is not true, lasting joy. Unless you're in, unless Christ is in you and you are with Christ. Now, Elizabeth recognized Mary's faith. I love this part. She gave a glad cry, verse 42, and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me. When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. I love how Elizabeth doesn't even focus on her child and focuses on Jesus. Oh, that's good. It's not about her. It's not about her child. It's about Jesus. But what I love about this scripture mostly is that she acknowledges her faith, that she believed that this impossible thing could happen. And it made me think, let me look at Zacharias and let me look at Mary's. Let me see the two in contrast with each other. Notice the difference between Zacharias' response and Mary's. Zachariah was doubtful, 
Mary believed before the miracle took place. It can happen to all of us. I'm going to read what I wrote. Years of praying and waiting, but no answer. We, be, we can become cynical and lose faith. The young Mary with childlike faith believed, but yet after a long time of praying, we can begin to doubt more and more. Am I talking to anyone here? When I first came into ministry, I was like, let's save the world. We can save the world. And then you start hitting all those struggles as a youth pastor. <laughs> this is just a little pastor's heart behind the scenes in, in a pastor's heart. We come in with rose, rosy glass eyes. And then you start finding out that it's a struggle to reach people and help them get saved and to follow Jesus and find deliverance and you can begin to lose hope. How many of you have been praying for a kid to get saved or a family member or a neighbor to get saved and you begin to lose hope, you become cynical, you start to wonder if God even hears your prayers? I'm talking real talk right now. We can begin to doubt that God hears our prayers and then right when you don't expect it, he answers it. The world is in our face, but we don't live by sight, but by faith. Oh, God, let me pray real quick. God, renew our faith. God, renew our faith in miracles. Renew our hope that you have heard our prayers. God, I want to see a revival in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, Lord, wake us up as churches. Lord, do your work and help us to start looking at you with the supernatural eyes, with spiritual vision, not human vision. Thank you, God. Lord, I pray you would answer those prayers we've been praying for years. <laughs> Even if it catches us off guard, Lord, do it. Even though we're believing now, God, we want to see it. In Jesus' name, amen. We can believe and pray for miracles. Lee Strobel has a new book out called The Case for Miracles and The Case for Heaven. Um, and he says, in our churches and even in our prayers, sometimes we subconsciously hold back from fully embracing the God who still performs the miraculous. That's what we're praying, that we'll embrace a God who still does the miraculous. Why? Salvation was born into this world through miracles. And we don't have to lose hope. We don't have to be in despair. We don't have to be in the dark. Because this is what happens next. John is born. There's a celebration. Zachariah can now talk again. He made sure that everyone named him John, okay? Zachariah can talk, and he prophesies some amazing words but I'm going to go down to the words that really hit me so much with this message today. And he says this in uh, verse 78. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. He's talking about Jesus. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And to guide us to the path of peace. That's beautiful. People are sitting in darkness right now in our world. People are in the shadow of death right now. Death is upon them, unfortunately. I, l I know a little bit about that as a pastor, but this past week I lost my cousin, a close cousin of mine. He passed away. And it was a complete surprise to us. We just, we didn't know that the cancer was so bad in his body. It was ravaging his body. We had no idea. And then, of course, as he's in the hospital, he contracts COVID at the hospital, and then it just takes him out. Didn't see that coming. Thank the Lord he's a believer in Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord. 
People are sitting in darkness and despair and the shadow of death, and they don't know Jesus. That scares me. That concerns me. That keeps me up at night. Because my last text message with my cousin was, this is bizarre, this is unreal, but I know God has a plan in it. And then I didn't see, I didn't get to speak to him again. That's faith. That's hope. That's light on his deathbed. That's amazing. Only Jesus can produce that kind of faith in someone's life. And I praise the Lord for that. He is the light. Do you know that Isaiah 9-2 was saying this hundreds of years before Jesus was born? It says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. John 1-5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Referring to Jesus. The light of the world. Why, why light? Well, light reveals the, uh, God to the nations. Light is Jesus being revealed to the nations. It's who is God? Who is he? Well, it's Jesus. God was shining Jesus to the world, showing himself. The light shows who we are. The light shows our sin. The light shows the way to salvation and how we should live. And the light shows us the way to eternal life. I thank God for the light. Light also in the book of John means righteousness or righteous living. God is calling us to not get swallowed up in the darkness and evil world and to participate in that He's calling us to be light. He's calling us to live righteous, holy, pure lives. He wants us to walk in the light, to walk like Jesus walks. That's what he's calling us to do. So how do we apply all these amazing scriptures to our life? Let me help make some sense to how we endure this world that we're going through right now. Can I read my paragraph? Because I think I did a pretty good job writing it. And I don't want to butcher it. Christmas for Christians is about the birth of Jesus and the fulfillment of God's promise. The promise given to Abraham that through his descendants, the world would be blessed. Through Abraham, a Messiah, a Savior would be born and his rule on the throne of David would never end. And with this Messiah would come salvation joy and prosperity, no more bondage, no more sorrow, and no more oppression. Now we have found salvation from our sin, and the inheritance of eternal life awaits us fully. We have it now, but fully revealed in the future. We patiently wait for the return of our Lord Jesus to save us from this world. Despair, sorrow, and darkness still looms. But in the midst of this, we have hope, we experience joy, and we remember that the darkness can never extinguish the light. Complete freedom from the pains of this world is yet to come and will come. So how can despair, hope, or how can despair and hope, sorrow and joy, darkness and light, how can they coexist? Because Jesus has come in this dark world, and now he lives in us. That's how it can coexist. Until Jesus returns for his church, we celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas by remembering where we've come from, where we're going, and what we should do while we wait. God said there will be troubles, but take heart. Jesus said this to his disciples. There will be troubles, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So I can't explain to you completely except for that. How do we have pain and joy at the same time? Because we're not in heaven yet. That's why. (laughs) That's what we're all yearning for. Our world is groaning for Jesus to come back. Can I get a little serious here for a moment? I'm doing good on time. Hang on. I hope I kept you awake. Our 
Our schools are crying out for help. Have you heard recently the threats of shootings and violence in our schools at Polytech, at CR in the past two weeks? Our world is crying out for help. Have you seen in the tragedy that happened in Kentucky? It's a natural disaster. And the best way that Christians can respond is to help and to pray. And the churches on the ground that have been affected, I, I promise you, churches are going to rise up and be a light in this darkness right now in Kentucky. Praise the Lord. What's happening in our nation and what's happening around the world it's the world crying out for a savior. And we know who he is. So remember Jesus during this time. The world was void of hope, joy, peace, and light. There was no deliverer. There's no salvation in this world. None in sight. And technically, this is so important. God revealed this to me this week. I want to make sure we understand this. Technically, Jesus didn't bring us hope because he is the hope. And let me explain that more. Hope is not some separate power or feeling that on the side of Jesus. Hope is Jesus. And there is no positive vibes that you can send someone that's going to help them. Hear me out. When people say, pray for me and send me positive vibes, just pray. <laughs> just pray. <clears throat> and then we can't just pray. We have to start telling people about Jesus. Because he is the hope. He is the joy. He is the peace. He is the light and the salvation. He is the righteousness that they need. He is who you need if you don't have Jesus today. Jesus doesn't bring hope. He is the hope. And yes, that way, he, he, then he does bring hope because he is the hope. That's what we're trying to say. That's what the Bible teaches. So I'm talking to you as a church today, and I'm talking to you as an unbeliever. Don't give up hope. To give up hope is to give up on Jesus himself. And Jesus is alive. He is the living hope. He will never die. We always have hope. There's been a lot of times where we could give up hope. We could give up our joy. We could give up into darkness. We should not. Do not give in to any of it. Do not give in to despair. Do not give in to evil things. Nothing Nothing evil is going to make you feel better. It's just going to make you feel worse when that temporary happiness fades away. He has given us a garment of praise to get through those hard times. He has given us Jesus Christ to get us through those hard times. I can't explain it. You have to experience it yourself. But I know this, you can see it on believers. And that's my last point. And by the way, all the notes are online at calvarydover.org forward slash grow. <laughs> Lastly, shine and show hope. Shine and show the light of Jesus Christ. We can't give in to the despair because the people who don't have Jesus need to know. And I get it. Look, I'm a pastor. I hear things all the time. I have people come to my office that are carrying heavy burdens, and I help carry them times. And then I have to give them to God because I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. You can't fix this world. Only God can, but God wants to use you to help. But you cannot take responsibility for someone falling away or all those things. It's a choice. It's down to what they decide to do. We need to shine. How can we do that? Let's get super practical. Let's come out of the shallow end real quick. Let's give cards of encouragement and hope. Let's give gifts. Let's put on a believe experience to help people have some fun. 
have some fun. Get on a pony and smile. I don't know. It works. Now listen, don't get happier. You know, we got to praise Jesus louder than a donut. Okay? Don't get more excited for a donut than Jesus. But why, why are we doing what we're doing with this whole like live nativity 2.0 going on here? Why? Because people don't know Jesus. And they don't know that he already came. And he is here to save and to get you through this crazy world that we're in with his praise, with his joy, with his light, with his hope. I'm so encouraged by this message today. I have felt the heaviness fall off my shoulders during this service, during this week. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Serve and help someone in need this week. Give a meal. Surprise a family. Surprise a neighbor with a free meal from Bob Evans. I don't know. It's pretty good. I prefer Texas Roadhouse. But anyway. Love on people. And they're going to be like, why are you so happy? Jesus, what are you doing this for? Because God loves you. Because there's still hope. There's still joy. The light is still shining. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Let's pray. We just need to do it. Don't give in. As you're closing your eyes, Remember the hope, joy, and light of Jesus. Don't give in to the world's despair and darkness, and instead shine and show the hope, the joy, and the light of Christ. And some of you have been through so much in your life, and you're doing it, and it's amazing to see. I clap for you. I'm your biggest fan. Some of you have been through cancer and sickness and loss and so much stuff, and you still serve people around you. You are my role model outside of Jesus Christ first. You are my role model. Thank you for being so strong for me to show me how to get through a week like this for me. God, you are so good. And we give up the spirit of heaviness and the burdens, the sorrow, despair, and the grief for the oil of joy. Beauty instead of ashes. Instead of despair and heaviness, we take on the garment of praise. We have the light of Jesus in us as believers. We have the hope of the world dwelling in us. We are your temples. God, I pray today, Lord, for all the guests we have met this past weekend that have been through so many things and the church had fun with them. The church spoke life, spoke Jesus Christ in them. We worship God in front of them. We show them that you can have joy in the midst of suffering. And we're human, and so we're going to have our times. But God, we turn to Jesus and nothing else during those times. God, I pray you would bless them, Lord, today at this final show. Lord, may they feel your spirit in this place. The true spirit of Christmas, Jesus Christ. God, draw them to this house. Draw them to a church. If it doesn't have to be ours, draw them to you most of all. Our heart at Calvary, your heart, is that all would know that none shall perish. And that even during this life, God, it would be bearable and as well as we wouldn't just survive, we would thrive. We'd be joyful and at peace. God, I pray for everyone in this room has been, who has been going through it, that the struggle has been tough. And God, I pray that, Lord, your joy would rise up in them. They, they would remember we have you, your son, Jesus. And there's anyone watching online or in this room who says, I need Jesus. I want to ask you to start talking to him and tell him to recognize that he is your Lord and Savior that he paid the price for your sins, to believe it. He rose again to give you eternal life. Believe that and receive Jesus. Ask him to come into your life and choose to follow him for the rest of your life. 
pray that today with your own heart, with your own words. And please let us know because we want to help you on that journey because that is a, a very short decision that changes an entire life and a lifestyle. God, save today. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. They are true. They're yes and amen. We thank you, God, for your salvation and your hope. We love you, Lord. Do amazing things for us, as you always do, as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can we give God praise and glory real quick? Praise the Lord. We thank you, God. You are a good God. You're an amazing God. And we praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Have a blessed day, church. I love you. Take care.